All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is my first time being at the conference. Happy to be here. My name is uh, Ziyuan. I'm an engineer manager at Pinterest, leading the ML uh, serving platform team. So today I want to share our journey of building our real-time machine learning inference system at Pinterest and also lessons that we learned along the way. All right, here's the agenda of, uh, of my talk today. Uh, first, I'll very briefly talk about Pinterest. What is Pinterest, what people are using it for, and also how we're using the recommender models to drive our products. Um, then I'll talk about um, our real-time machine learning inference system, how the system evolved over time. And then uh, I'll discuss a few optimization tips to make uh, GPU inference efficient. So we're going to get very technical and dive down to, to the details. Uh, just a preview, I won't be talking about any of the common model optimization technologies like model quantization or model distillation, but instead I'll be talking about how uh, adapting machine learning inference affects our system architecture design and also a few tricks that we did to make, uh, to dramatically increase the GPU utilization. All right, let's get uh, started. Okay, first, Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest is a visual discovery engine. And this is the place that people come to find inspirations to uh, do what they love in their life and also the tools to realize those inspirations in their uh, real lives. And uh, people come to Pinterest to, uh, for all kinds of different inspirations. People come to find you know, what to uh, eat for lunch, what to wear for, for work. People use it for um, organizing parties, to plan for their trips, to plan for their weddings. Uh, people use it for to collect interesting artworks, uh, ideas to decorate their homes. And Pinterest is essentially a collection of ideas. And an idea is represented as a pin on the platform. A pin at its very classic form is a thumbnail image that people save from the internet as a bookmark. But over the years, we have expanded the, the pin into many other different media formats as well. So in, as of today, it can be also you know, short form videos, can be a product that you can purchase can be you know, a collection of Im images, like a multi-step tutorial to cook a, cook a, a, a dish. And um, the pins um, is presented to the users in a number of different product surfaces at Pinterest. So to give you a few examples, we have a home feed, which is the endless feed that the people see the fir first time when they log on to the, uh, the platform. We also have search, not only the traditional text-based search, but also image-to-image -image search and also camera search that you can take a camera, uh, take a picture with your camera and then search for that object on the, on the platform. We also have shoppable pins, which is a product that Pinterest can recognize the products inside a scene and then find that product for you or recommend, uh, recommend similar products for you to purchase. We also have what we call idea pin, which is the full screen format pin that can be a you know, short form video, can be also a collection of different images. We also have a spotlight, which is basically pins organized uh, by ideas or by topics that we can recommend to the users. From a technical perspective, you can see you know, a lot of these are driven by recommendation system. Let's actually take a look at one uh, recommendation sy uh, system as an example. So home feed. Um, as the Pinterest recommendation system, we want the system to be able to do a few things. Number one, we want the system to be able to sift through billions of uh, contents in a short period of time. Um, as of today, we have roughly uh, 400 billion pins that people saved on the platform, and we need to generate a good enough recommendation with, uh, for the users normally within the latency budget of 200 to 300 milliseconds. Also, we want the system to embrace uh, multi-objective optimization, so we don't only care about whether the user click or not. We also want to optimize for you know, how much time they have spent on a certain pin, whether they saved it in the, to their boards, and other actions that they might take. Also, the prediction needs to be very performant. As of today, at peak hours, our system collectively uh, serve roughly 300 to 500 million items per second. So that's a very large scale, and we need to have very, very efficient prediction to not have a crazy uh, infra cost. And lastly, we want the system to be responsive to uh, user feedback and be able to adapt to the changing uh, preference from the users. So how do we build a system like that? Well, this is an oversimplified view of uh, the home feed recommendation system, right? Roughly three stages. Uh, the first stage is a candidate generation stage where we generate candidates from different sources. Um, the, for example, here we are generating candidates from, for example, the, the topics or the users that this user follows, and also we can retrieve 
uh, relevant candidates from the embedding space that we train uh, from our data set. So the candidates are fed into a ranking model which computes a score for uh, the user engagement prob uh, probability. And then we have the uh, policy layer in the end which we apply certain constraints like for example the quantity of the fresh pins that we want to show to the users. So you can see there are a lot of machine learning components in this uh, diagram and for the, this talk let's focus on only on the ranking model. So what does the ranking model looks like for us? Well, this is the journey of how we involve the machine learning model over time. Without going too much detail onto each model, you can see roughly we uh, started first from 2014, where we introduced the first machine learning based ranking model, a linear model. Then over time, we adopted to the tree model, GBDT models, neural networks, deeper neural networks. We introduced a new type of features, real time features, graph embedding features, and also the network got bigger and bigger and more complicated. Um, so as you can see, every time we adopt a new model architecture or introduce a new type of features, we got a pretty nice engagement gain, uh, ranging from 3% to 11 or 12%. And what about the system behind that? What, are, what systems uh, are we using to serve these models? So it turned out our system needs to evolve together with the model architecture. So roughly, our, our system was built in three different stages. For the first stage, from 2014 to 2017, um, we had something like this. We have a DSL library. Right? At its core, it's a set of machine learning operators that we wrote in-house at Pinterest. And what it does is it can load the model weights from the model trained externally. Uh, this can be linear model. The weights from the linear model can be the tree model trained by XGBoost. Also can be the neural network weights trained by uh, TensorFlow. And the feature comes in as blobs, and each team has their own you know, feature transformation that knows how to deserialize the blob and uh, transform the feature into the format that the model understands. And the prediction comes out. So this works pretty well for us. People were able to write very, very efficient uh, machine learning operators. And up until a point that you know, everyone's doing deep learning, right? And we found that as a small team, we cannot really keep up with all the new uh, machine learning uh, operators, uh, the, the layers that came up. So we decided to do something new. We decided to, to build a new library called an uh, inference engine. So what we did is we embedded a TensorFlow lib uh, runtime unit. Um, so this is a C++ embedded library. It can serve multi models. It's a multi tenancy model runner. It also, also handles things like dynamic batching, which, which we can merge requests uh, you know, from different uh, users. And also, this is, uh, there's a thing we call unified feature format. So what this is is a, a, a standardized feature container, a set of data types that we defined, and also a rule to translate all those data into tensors. Uh, so this standardized all the features and allowed you know, different teams and different user, uh, different models to share the same features. So this works, again, pretty well for us for a couple of years. And uh, fast forward to 2022, more and more people are doing deep learning, productivity becomes a big thing, and the model becomes bigger. So people find that you know, they love using PyTorch, which is a big productivity gain for them. So we decided to add PyTorch support, and we make it a first class citizen, and uh, this becomes a multi-framework, multi-tenancy model runner. We also added uh, the accelerator support because the model is getting bigger. Of course, we have the most mature support for NVIDIA GPU, but we also have more experiment, uh, experimental stuff for, for example, uh, AWS Inferentia. So um, we have this inference engine library. How does that fit into the production system we have? Right? Uh, the inference engine as a library runs in a number of different systems inside Pinterest, but the most popular choice is this model server uh, that we build around it. This is a full-fledged ranking service um, that handles everything. So it's doesn't only do uh, inference, but also can fetch features from the feature store. So the, the client don't need to fetch the feature by themselves, but instead they, they pass the feature ID and what type of feature they want to fetch, and we can get the feature for them. Since we already have the feature inside the model server, we also added a feature cache. So pretty straightforward. And also, of course, the model server handles a lot of uh, logistics like you know model deployment, model monitoring, and all that. So after having this model server, uh, we also added a root leaf architecture to it. Uh, this is to add more parallelism to the system to get the results faster. The root server has the request and split, split up the request into smaller pieces. Each leaf node runs the model server and then gets the small piece of the results. 
This is faster and it's worth to note that actually the feature cache layer benefit a lot from this architecture because um, with the help of a consistent hashing algorithm, this is kind of like a, a sharded cache setup that each leaf node only handles a fixed subset of the cache key space, which makes the, the heat rate of the cache much higher. All right. So this is the architecture we have been running for uh, a few years and we're happy with the scalability, the flexibility and performance of the system up until, uh, up until a point where we want to do GPU inference. So why do we want to do G GPU inference? Well, this happens when we want to uh, adopt a transformer model, right? Th this model runs very well in, the, uh, in our offline evaluation and we put that model onto the online system for benchmark. So first we put that model on the CPU. The model is roughly 30X larger than before, uh, a baseline CPU model that is not a transformer. So the latency we found is you know, over 30 times uh, slower and the throughput is down at 95%, very bad. And we put model then on GPU. We thought it's gonna work because the model is already trained on GPU after all, right? And we found latency, well, it's much better, but it's still more than three times slower than the baseline and the throughput is uh, down 96%. So we cannot really ship this model because it's gonna, you know, we're gonna spend much, much more money uh, in production. So we need to figure out what's happening. We start the uh, NVIDIA profiler and found about this re profiling results, right? If you look at the highlighted box here, which is where the GPU is spending their uh, its time, it's very obvious that the GPU is not fully utilized because you can see a lot of gaps between the kernels, right? And we did some investigation and find the root cause being two things. Number one, it's small, op, uh, small batches. Number two, it's small ops. Small batches means at certain time, we're, at, we're actually seeing much smaller batch of data comparing to the training time because you know, the request comes in continuously and we have to serve those requests uh, on the fly. And small ops means we have a lot of small, cheap operations from our model. These two things com combined, it's very bad for GPU because we know GPU has a huge number of cores, very efficient for uh, very computational uh, intensive workload on a large amount of data. But if we have small data plus very cheap computation, the upfront cost of doing a lot of GPU operation starts to, to dominate. And you know, that cost can be amortized otherwise if we have larger batches and larger ops. So what can we do about it? Can we increase the batch size? Can we get rid of the small ops? Well, we can do both. Let's talk about the first one, the increasing uh, batch size. Just a recap of the system architecture here. We have this root leaf architecture, right? Um, if you think about it, th this is actually the opposite of what we want because the root is split splitting a big batch into smaller ones. So the first thing we need to do, I guess, is to remove the root layer. And that's what we did. So now the model server, the leaf nodes are seeing all the requests. It works because you know, we're seeing much larger batch sizes. But soon enough, we uh, start to notice that you know, there are other things starts to break. The first thing that broke was the feature cache layer that we talked about that the feature cache benefit a lot from um, having this root leaf layer because uh, the cache heat rate is high. Now, every model server needs to handle uh, the entire cache key space, which reduce the cache heat rate dramatically. So what we did, we need to adopt to a new cache implementation. Basically, this is, uh, we're using this uh, library called cachelib. This is the in-process cache um, library, open sourced and built by teams at Meta. So what it can do is to support a hybrid cache mode by utilizing both memory and SSD at the same time. Um, of course, this is not as fast as purely memory cache, but at least this can give us enough uh, cache hit rate to shield most of the, the uh, requests to the feature store. The second thing we found starts to break is this feature pre-processing pre uh, step in, on CPU. Remember that we have this uh, unified feature container format, right? So we need to convert that feature format onto, into tensors every time. And th that conversion includes uh, things like casting between different data types, changing the data layouts, concatenating data together. These are data intensive work on the CPU. And we start to notice that you know, when we're increasing the batch size, the CPU starts to you know, not be able to catch up and becomes bottleneck of the system. This is 
particularly bad because we're using the GPU instance from the cloud providers, AWS. And their GPU instance normally don't have the latest generation CPU or the most powerful CPU, which makes sense, but it's actually making our problem much worse. So what we did, we are adopting to a new architecture where we, uh, what we call remote inference. Basically, the, the idea is to separate, strictly separate the CPU intensive work and GPU intensive work. Um, so this comes uh, with two benefits. Number one, of course, we can use the very, very powerful CPU instance from AWS to do the, the CPU intensive work, which is very cost efficient. And also, we can now scale the two clusters, CPU and GPU, independently. So it's very flexible for us to allocate cost uh, to the OR cluster. Uh, worth to note that this is actually the architecture we thought about before GPU serving, but it, it didn't work at the time because when everything runs on CPU, uh, the cost of moving the feature around between different hosts or different cluster is uh, a big overhead for the entire uh, cluster. But with the new hardware, with, with everything running on GPU, the trade-offs, the, the assumptions are totally different, and this architecture starts to make sense. So what's the takeaway here? Well, CPU and GPU requires the opposite types of workload. CPU requires smaller batches, GPU requires bigger batches. So when designing a system, we have to really decouple those two components so that we can get the best, the ideal workload for both of them. Otherwise, we are stuck in between and have suboptimal workload for both CPU and GPU. All right, that's what we did for removing the, the root server and increased batch size. Now let's talk about the small operations, the small ops. So uh, let's first take a look at where the small ops came from. This is, uh, again, the oversimplified view of our model, the first few layers, at least. Um, on the very left, we have a bunch of features in the host memory. First, we need to copy the features to the device memory. And then for each feature, we need to run some feature preparation ops. And then we concatenate everything together, and we run a lot of computation for the rest of the neural networks. Right? Features are grouped into two categories, roughly sparse features, you know, IDs, categorical, uh, categorical features, and also dense features. Um, so we found that there were a lot of places for the small ops to came up. I'm gonna talk about two of them today. Number one is when we transfer the data from host to device. Number two is when we're running the feature preparation, uh, especially for the sparse features. Okay, first one, the host device data transfer. When running any uh, GPU model, the first thing we need to do is to copy the input data onto the device, onto GPU. This is what we do for, you know, when we're calling two dot two device uh, running PyTorch. What the framework does for us underneath is they're calling uh, this CUDA MAM copy call um, for each uh, individual tensors. So this is uh, not bad, um, unless you have a lot of small tensors, hundreds of tensors, which unfortunately is exactly our case. So how do we tackle this? we did something smarter. So instead of having individual tensors being copied, we actually maintain two buffers, one on the host memory, one on GPU memory. And we copy all the tensor data to those buffers. And we create the tensors in a way that they're not owning their data anymore. Instead, instead they are uh, more like a template or a shallow tensor that points to an offset to those buffers. So in this way, we can copy whole, the whole data into um, GPU by using only one CUDA map copy call. So this is, you know, makes things much faster for us. Of course, this doesn't come for free. This comes at a cost of, you need to ma now manage the buffers, you need to manage the life cycles, um, and it's very tricky to do. And also you need to start to worry about the, the low level details like the memory alignment, for example, you know, in both the CPU and GPU memory. But it's worse to do for us, and that's what we did. Second thing I wanna talk about is the merge how we merge the operators, right? One, uh, the example I wanna talk about today is the uh, embedding lookups. So for sparse features, normally the feature preparation involves first translate the feature value into a ID and then look up uh, from an embedding table by using that ID, right? So if you think about the, the logic here, we don't really have to run the lookup like 100 times if we have a 100 feature, but instead we can do something smarter. We can early concatenate everything into one ID vector and do a multi-key uh, lookup. So this is, uh, if you recognize it, this is uh, uh, the idea of ops fusion, right? 
And this theoretically can be done by the ops fusion technologies like you know, TensorRT. But in practice, we found that the fusers struggles to really find the opportunity to merge ops together, especially when it spans through you know, hundreds of different features. So we ended up having to rewrite the model manually and uh, rewrite also the merged ops uh, by ourselves. All right. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, CUDA graph. Now, CUDA graph is a CUDA API slash runtime that NVIDIA provides. The idea is that even if we're running all these kernels uh, back to back, if the kernels are small, there's a still a chance that there's a, uh, there are going to be gaps between the kernels on the GPU, which is the waste of the GPU time. So the CUDA graph, instead of running the kernels one by one, it runs the whole model at once by using an example uh, input. And then CUDA graph actually traces what's happening in between and saves you know, all the kernels that runs. So it saves everything as a static graph. And every time we run the inference, we just need to run that graph instead of running individual tensors, uh, I'm sorry, uh, kernels. So um, this actually eliminates all the kernel launch overhead for us. And it's, it's a very big speed up. Of course, this is not free as well. Um, by having everything static, number one, we cannot have dynamic batch size anymore. So if we don't have enough data, we have to handle padding. This is especially challenging for uh, features like sparse feature, right? The, the length is uh, different for each request. And also, um, this involves a lot of manual uh, lifecycle management for low level data. And um, to give you one example, because everything is static, even the, the input data has to sit at the exact same memory address for each inference, which makes things like model threading very, very challenging. But again, uh, this is a huge speed up, so we are happy to pay that cost and uh, be more efficient. So takeaway for uh, the small ops, the takeaway here is that well, short-lived kernel is an enemy of GPU efficiency. So before you can make sure that uh, your GPU is fully utilized and you are not spending time on you know, running all these small ops, it doesn't really make sense to look anywhere else. Okay, so with everything we talked about today, I wanna show the results again. Um, so on the left, we have our old model, transfer model, 30x larger. Uh, it's uh, more than three times uh, slower than the baseline. On the right, while we're doing all this optimization, the machine learning engineer at Pinterest actually make a bigger model, right? more than twice bigger. And it's 77x uh, lar larger than before, but you can see the latency actually much lower. It's uh, down 29% comparing to the old small CPU model. And the throughput is higher, uh, up 20, uh, 23%. So I hope this results give you an idea of you know, how much more efficiency or space there is just by doing all these small things correctly and without touching you know, the model or quantitize the model even. And hopefully, you know, this can inspire you uh, to look at your own system and find a few things to optimize for. That's all I got for today. Happy to answer any questions.